Welcome back once again to your favorite internet radio show. It's the No Class Podcast with your internet friends, Eddie and Matt. So today we've just got a grab bag of crap for you. <laughs> so let's find out what we're going to talk about. Matt, what's the first thing you'd like to talk about today? The very first thing? Yeah. Unload on them. The long con. Uh, same, shameless self-promotion. Duh. No scruples. Um, but no, seriously, went by the uh, Hilton Garden Inn, which is the nicest hotel in town. And we have negotiated for everyone a brilliant rate. Awesome. $99 for a room. But you have to avail yourself of it via the link. And so when I went there and said, how are we doing? They said, well, you really don't have that many room sold. And I said, are you sure? Pull up. I said, check that date. And start, they started riddling off names. And I'm like, that person's coming to our con. That person's bought a ticket. So there's people that God bless have bought tickets, but didn't avail themselves of the link. So they're, they're spending a lot more cash, but also when we get people use the link, we get credit or at least let them know. Even if you, you I want to use my Hilton honor points, forget your rate, but let them know you're with the con. Cause then we get credit and we might be able to get discounts. We could pass on to you. Anyway, well, I think part of what you're saying is yeah. that we want to get credit for everybody that books a room there. Mm -hmm. But if you don't use the rate, we can still get credit. Oh, absolutely. So that's the important thing. Let them know that you're with us. Mm -hmm. Or if when we see the list of names, we'll go, yeah, that person's there. But this is, as I understand it, the best rate you will get, even if you go to one of those Travagos yeah, yeah. or Hotels.com, et cetera, we, and so forth. We already saw one guy who did that. I know this guy. I bet you he thought, boy, you know, I'm, I've outsmarted you. No, this is the rock bottom best rate you can possibly get. We negotiated. This guy went through some other company and paid more. You know, he basically like get out of your own way, you know, but anyway, but, but talking about that while I was there visiting, there's a reason why this hotel's on top. And part of it is, yeah, it's a great looking hotel and it's just the best one in town. But the team there, the sales team is brilliant. While I'm there, this one girl goes, Oh, I was spitball an idea. How would y'all like, like a themed menu, like for appetizers, like, you know, jalapeno poppers, but call them dragon eggs or, you know, I stuff. We like already that. had that idea. Well, we did, but oh, okay. But but then they had it as well without prompting, unless we already synchronicity. Yeah, and then they even talked about like themed drinks, and I thought that might be getting a little cheesy, hokey. Well, but let's throw that out there to the listeners. That's what I'm saying. Sound off, people. Because would you like a dragon's blood frozen daiquiri or something, or, or would you, you think go that's like that's, that's lame? Silly. Yeah, even I was kind of like, Ugh. it's kind of cringing a little bit. Like that's but too far. We're going to, we've discussed this already. We're going to talk with the hotel food staff folks and kind of hopefully curtail some of that cringiness. Yeah. So you may have the long con lunch special. But but we might be a couple of jaded old jerks. Y'all might be like, I love the idea of the vampire's souffle or whatever. The, there are you know. some people that would, no pun intended, eat that up. <laughs> Ooh. But anyway, yeah. But we'll never know unless you, you know, let us know. The fine line is, it, would the majority of people think, oh, that's cute and hilarious, and yeah, we should go for that? Or would the majority of them go, eh, that's no, hokey. that's stupid and hokey yeah. and cheesy? But I'm, I'm an old curmudgeon, so no whatever. Kidding. All right, uh, so we got that out of the way. We got the shameless part. Do we? Okay, what else do we want to talk about? Well, if you're opening up the shameless promotion, we can talk about the long con spring just for a minute. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can tell you have no interest in that. That's not true at all. But I will say we do have one coming up in the spring and that we're trying out logos. And names. And all that right now. I think we've got the name. No. <laughs> the Long Con Spring, period. Oh, oh, good. Yes, yes, we do have a name. Excellent. I love it. Now, if you're a cool cat, you may refer to it as the Long Con Spring Roll. Just not like my role presence. Play. Or I'll wretch a little bit. <laughs> so now you know how to get under Matt's skin. Go ahead and use that as much as you want. But I think the design we're going to use, and this is subject to change, is just going to be the same old wax seal in green for spring. Clever. Keep because it simple, why stupid. change it? Kiss. There you go. Keep it simple, stupid. I like it. If it ain't broke, blip your blap. And one more plug while we're doing this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we talked about this last time. We may have, but Geek World our friendly local game shop in Tyler is moving next month, probably in the mid part of the month. They're getting 
like three times the space. It's it's huge. You can play football in there. So if you're local around here or close enough where you can go to Tyler to a game shop, the only one complaint I ever had on Geek World it was, was the space. We were and cramped they fixed up the there. the problem, yeah. And which I'm glad because Mark and that bunch there are just a great bunch of people, and we can't say enough good things. And so I'm tickled that, like I said, the only complaint we ever had was space. Well, that that that's a non-issue now. If yeah. anything, I'm trying to figure out how they're going to fill that space. So I think I was just there for the last time into the old space for free RPG day, mm-hmm. which was pretty good. I won a uh, dragon in a drawing. Oh, cool! It's part of which bones are they up to now? I want to say. Four, but that doesn't sound right to me. It seems like it should be. Okay. It seems like it should be higher to me, but I think this is a dragon out of the soon-to-be-released Bones 4. Cool, yeah. So the person I want it from is like, hey, you could eBay that right now, probably make a few bucks. Probably could. But, of course, that could also end up in our Uh, roller cage raffle. Roller cage, yeah. The raffle, that's not a raffle. The squeaky cage. Mm Mm-hmm. We'll call it anything but the R word. So anything else we need to... uh, push or publicize anything exciting happened this week no i mean <laughs> i'm about to work myself to death but that's that's personal stuff we're here to talk about fun things that's fine but, yeah but long, well let me give you one more then sure, before you it. launch into it yeah. e3 mm-hmm. we've just actually gone through that mm-hmm. so there's been a lot of games announced and i'm really just a role-playing game kind of dude so the only one that really sparked my imagination was the eldon ring oh yeah so, Which, this was one of my things, was like, hey, what are you excited about that's coming out soon? So, oh, I'm excited about that. I'm sorry all of you uh, Song of Fire and Ice fans are not going to get your next book so that I can get my next game. But That's too funny. Yeah, I guess GRR is involved. Yeah, him and the uh, makers of Dark Souls. So hopefully this will be a little bit more back towards the Dark Souls formula than Sekiro. Cool. That's awesome, man. But definitely looking forward to that. Yeah, even, even I've seen some things I'm like, wow, that looks cool. So, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, I, we didn't mention, uh, what is Baldur's Gate 3? Yeah, I'm kind of excited about that. Yeah, that one should be good. That old school, I love those, those. I mean, some of my uh, text tones are uh, snippets, sound bites from Baldur's Gate. This better be good. Yeah, you know, sleep lightly, Taskmaster. Oh, I love that. All right, back on track. All right, well, what track? But anyway, so um, just kind of a general grab bag of things uh like you said you're excited about that um you know just talking about gaming in general you know we really haven't done that have we on these podcasts talk about just gaming in general no we've usually had a hidden agenda a lot of the cons i think have had a lot of con content like hey this is what's coming up at the con this is did red river survive that sort of thing so i mean and, and whereas people are listening so apparently they want to hear about the cons but i figured you know, gaming. Uh, um, so, like, you figure 5th edition has been out for a while. Like, how long has 5th edition been out? I'm going to go with five or six years. I'm yeah. Tr- trying to remember how far back. Maybe, yeah, about that. So, you figure, like, like takeaways from 5th edition. We, we've seen where we go to an old school con every year, NTRPG. We just got back, had a blast. And um, we'd seen where some of the newer games would get a little bit of play there. Because those guys are good about letting people bring. If you can fill a table, you you can you can run most any game there. But um, people hadn't really embraced a lot of the newer, you know, games. This is an old school con mostly, but Fifth Edition has really caught on, and it caught on heck years ago. Um. So, uh, uh, like Fifth Edition, what what's a, obviously some people like it because it's it's kind of got a little bit of that old school feel, without being old school. Um. Like what else do you like about Fifth Edition? I like uh, uh, I like inspiration. That's probably my favorite thing from Fifth Edition is inspiration. Yeah, definitely. I would say the fact that it brings back the old school feel, and why does it? Why and how does it bring back the old school feel? What makes it feel old school to you? Well, we knew that back in the old days it was rules light. You know, there just weren't as many rules. Uh, and then, you know, other versions of the game, not going to bash any versions, but, you know, there were like an encyclopedic, you know, amount of books and all this rules to keep up with this minutia. And some people live for that, and, and, and that's great, but you're going to find the great number of people don't, A, and B, new players coming to a game are going to be intimidated by a lot of rules. And you notice that 5th edition has sold really well. Well, they, they pulled back. 
and it's a little more rules light. That, that's my take on. It. I think one of the reasons why it's more popular and it feels maybe like a throwback to the old days. Yeah. Now you know, fourth edition was much maligned, and probably it deserved some of that. Yeah, the, you see the look he's giving me, like, oh, really? You're gonna you're, you're gonna step on that landmine? But like, what 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 rule do we still use that we caught from fourth edition? bloodied bloodied it's nice for your players to kind of have an idea like well how are we like they're they've done 100 points of damage and they're like are we kicking its butt and i go have i said the magic word yet And they're like oh crap you know but when you've got it beat down to half hit points i go the creature looks bloodied you know and that way they go oh, okay okay we're halfway there um and i also it's a shame that they didn't keep this going i kind of like minions i like the concept you're a huge fan of minions oh yeah absolutely i mean i, I like that Thing. You're always painting yourself yellow and putting on those goofy goggles. Oh, teehee, you're so funny. Thank you. Um, but then in, moving on to different game systems. Well, Go ahead. what was Minions? Explain that for the people that m- might have never played oh, okay. fourth yeah, edition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's what's uh, the Minions were. Say you've got this orc over here that's kicking your butt, and it might have 30, 40 hit points. But there'd be a Minion, maybe mixed in Minions, that have literally the same stats, the only difference, one hit point. Now, you might go, wait, so here's things. People would ignore those minions to their detriment because that minion's beating you down as hard as any other work there. But the idea is if you turn your attention on the minion, minions, you can blow them away. And so the great thing was if you're that wizard playing crowd control, which it was always aggravating like early D&D when uh, you'd go, the fighter would run up and hit one and kill it in one hit. And the wizard would go, well, here, let me soften him up. He shoots all the others with a fireball, but he really chokes out a bunch of ones and twos and threes. You don't kill even one orc. Or, or whatever they are. And you're like, oh, man. You know what I mean? Like, that sucks. But you did soften them all up. Eh. But you really didn't crowd control there, you know. Well, if every one of those minions has one hit point, if you drop that air effect spell, you're guaranteed you're going to wipe out all those scrubs. You're going to feel good about yourself. And, hey, look at me. I crowd controlled and made the situation better. Or if you're the ranger that can get two shots off, boom, boom. You can take out two minions in one round, you know. I don't know, but like I said, some people go, ah, they're minions. Uh Uh-uh, they they hit just as hard as anything else there. They're just, but they're supposed to be a scrub. They're that minion that backs up the lieutenant, you know, or whatever. Anyway. That's definitely one of the rules that I hear people still talk about that they kept. It's pretty much, a lot of people kept bloodied as a descriptor. And then if you kept a rule from fourth, it was probably the minions. And that's the thing is you wouldn't necessarily give them one hit point, but you could look at like if they've got five dice worth of hit dice, whether it be a die eight, die 12, give them the literal min, a minimum. So just go, I'm not going to roll the dice. They've got five hit points. So that's, you know, you've, you've put them at that minion status or whatever with minimum hit points. Anyway, so there's that. Um, now, another game that I'm fond of is DCC and all the various... I have never heard of it. Really? Yeah, it's a great game. What does that stand for? Uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics by Goodman Games. Now, if there was an MCC, that might be... Mutants? Correct the window. Yeah, Mutant Crawl Classics. But your best bet would be to talk to the uh, Arklatex Road Crew. They could probably run you a game and give you more information. Oh, that'd be really cool. Yeah, that's handy. But no, um, and there's been so many derivatives uh, people have made. And the company's really good about not, like, sending a team of lawyers to, you know, quell these sort of things. There's, like, Star Crawl, which is space. MCC, of course, is, like, post-APOC. Uh, kind of like a But game. that's their officially licensed that, that's product, official, right? Yeah, and that's, like, you know, Gamma World-esque. Um, and they, they've just, David Betty just successfully, it just finished, kick-started, um, Dark Trails. Yeah, Dark Trails. And that's, of course, the Weird West. Um, and then there's there's Cyber Sprawl Classics, which is sort of a cyberpunk. Um, you know, you could add in fantasy and be Shadow Run. But yeah, so there's a lot of people have done content that plugs in, you know, to, with that. And so the thing I love, I like a lot of things about DCC, but probably my favorite thing is the Lux stat. And that's unique to them. Like a lot of things like, yeah, yeah, it's, that's nothing new in this, you know, but the luck stat's kind of a, a new concept. It is, but it isn't. Yeah. Okay. But as, I mean, a, as a luck stat. Yeah. But when you get into the like fleeting luck, I remember when we first discovered that we were like, wow, how new and interesting. And then we went, well, you got paranoia with perversity points and other just dis- different systems have their way of rewarding you. Yeah, we Not that around. there's anything wrong with that. But maybe that wasn't quite as, as original a concept as we wanted to grant them. But it was completely entertaining. We really loved it. Oh, yeah, and we luck. still use that all the time for funnels. Everyone loves winning luck. Um, 
but yeah, because like for people that aren't familiar, luck is an attribute, but it's also you know fungible. I mean, you can you can spend those points as a resource. So how many times have you missed that saving throw that killed your character in D and D by one or two points? You're like, man, if only. Well, yeah, you can burn a couple points of permanent luck to add to a role to, or that time when you know the big bad is like the GM says he's on his knees, he's quavering, you know, he's about to fall over and you're like, man, if only I could, and you, you whiff and barely miss him. You know, you did, you're like, oh, he's going to get one more round on us and might kill somebody, but you go, nope, I'm going to burn one or two luck points. The blow connects, you're a big darn hero, you know, but eventually if you keep doing that, you're going to run out of luck. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, concept it's a good mechanic and yeah, i love it the one thing that i also like about luck that we haven't talked about yet is luck checks because whenever i need to know something now like uh, the player asks hey can i find a uh, some useful item laying around i go make a luck check yeah. i don't have to think about that anymore if you pass hooray for you you did good if you don't it's on your role and not me as a gm telling you no <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and I was getting to that. I love that about luck. And the best part is, see, as the player burnt, presses their luck and keeps burning it, it's going to be harder to make those luck checks. So that's kind of makes you not want to go crazy burning luck, you know. Um, in my funnel I ran at DC at uh, NTRPG, one of the players just burnt their luck down to like three really early in the game. And the next thing you know, it's I'm calling for luck checks, and they're kind of whining. I'm like, well, you burnt your luck down to three. You know, but I said, you still have a 15% chance on a die 20 to make that luck check. So. But you really have to do something like that because in a tournament funnel or something like that, One where off. you're like, we'll never see this character again. There's no reason not to burn your luck all the way down unless you do something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one of the interesting articles I read recently was something, I believe it's attributed to Tim Kask who's one of the old guard of Dungeons and Dragons, where hit points uh, as a concept, uh, it's or, or basically if somebody's swinging at you and they, uh, and they, 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 you know, they do damage, but the idea is they didn't necessarily hit you, you know, but it's kind of like your character, like he would call for one, okay, the, the thing to tell me what happened. And it's a chance for like a little light role playing to go, well, you know, my guy twisted or turned or paired the blow, but still because it made the sword vibrate, it kind of sunk, you know, made your arm a little sore or you got a bruise or it's kind of like, it's only that last shot that puts you at zero hit points is really the telling. The only time you've really been run through or, or a telling blow. So all the other hit points up to that point really weren't like actual damage you took, but it's just maybe a, a, a bruise or, or you twisted something or you sprained something or, or whatever. So that's why you're just as effective at full hit points at, as you are at one hit point. Bingo. Right? Yeah. And that's why, yeah, because players would play and go, why is my character fresh, you know, able to keep running or fighting even though I'm down to like three hit points? Well, you weren't, you haven't necessarily had that, that telling hit yet is the concept and then that kind of helps then it makes sense when you go back oh okay you know yeah because i can remember thinking you're you're as fresh as a daisy at one hit point as you are at 20 it's like what you know but anyway i'll let you know that matt has the list of topics today <laughs> uh, so the, the plight of casters <laughs> <laughs> yes the plot of casters um you know like in the early days of like D, you got one spell one that's how it should be really is that are you you owning that or just being argumentative both okay typical but no um you, you might would have say like three spells in your spell book i think you know in the dmg they came back and said like one defensive one offensive one miscellaneous they had like a list a, sh a short list but you basically got one spell and that's it intelligence modifier doesn't matter you know the most brilliant wizard or or not um and then you know how like then the cleric could wear full armor got a better attack chart they would get bent a uh, bonus cat spells because of exemplary wisdom i mean it was just like you know wow really you know uh but anyway you know things have certainly changed with the game like now in fifth edition you got at will uh, cantrips you can cast over and over again that are actually pretty darn good, you know. Yeah, that keeps 
the uh, spellcaster from getting bored, I think. Yeah, I mean, I can remember before, like, Bip, shot you one magic missile, all right. And, I mean, you know, you couldn't even use, like, a crossbow or a bow. So it's like you're you're pulling out darts, and you're throwing darts you know, <laughs> for you, the rest of the adventure. You, you had know? done your thing for the day. You yeah. were done. Yeah, I mean, so you can see where that really wasn't probably a ton of fun for the caster. But it was a bit of a trade-off. Absolutely. Back in the olden days, because the fighter was going to carry you for a while. Oh, yeah. But after that, the roles were going to change. The positions were going to switch. If the campaign went long enough, if. you would see yeah, it's a big if. That Yeah, I mean, yeah, a complete role reversal where the, the fighter's like overshadowed by the wizard who's now bending the laws of physics and, and owning and destroying. and Oh, yeah. Fighters never learn wish. Yeah, exactly. That's I think that's the easiest way yeah. to put it. But that was the the shame of it was, I mean, how many times campaigns would peter out around about six eighth level, mm -hmm. if even then, and uh, it just the, the player stamina, the GM stamina, life events, holidays, you know, whatever. But uh, so no, I'm I mean I didn't get to play a high level wizard played from level one up until I was in the uh, Living Greyhawk campaign i got a in which the, the top level then was i think 15th level you had to retire after that i had a, a 15th level caster but that's the only time i got to cast those ooh ah spells and blah 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 but even at a lower level you were doing more with your lower level spells than one dude with a sword usually wouldn't you say if you were doing your job as a controller well i mean my character really didn't i mean i always said that in the early days ad and d your character really didn't start to even kind of be effective till about fifth level. That was my opinion. And I played a lot mm -hmm. of casters in, in 3.5 living Greyhawk around the time I hit about seventh level, which is pretty far in my character's career to me. But at that point, my character became truly effective and was an effective member, you know, on, on the table that that's me. But then again, I played one of those weird prestige classes. So anyway, but definitely by 12th level, I was making things happen, and from that point on, the fighters whined and sniveled. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. It was all about you for 10 levels, and now you're going to whine because, uh, okay. You know, I mean, oh, there was some butt hurt, you know. But, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, like I said, just through the years, the casters, like, cantrips were one of the best things they ever did. For sure. But the fighters and uh, the melee and all that now, I think when they get up into the higher levels, have a lot more bells and whistles than fighters did back in the day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's one of the things about, once again, I'm bringing up 4th edition, was those little special abilities that the other classes got that you might say, well, it's kind of like their melee spell. They got some cool stuff as they leveled up, like a rogue got a thing cascading blows where they could just, if they hit, they got to right. stab again. So if you just keep hitting, I mean, it just got ludicrous, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely the, the newer, they're trying to balance things out, but I don't know that, uh, balance is something you can never really have in these kind of games. And I don't necessarily know if I'd want it because you love DCC's magic system. I do. You know, I mean, even I am as stymied by it sometimes as a game master and I've seen players that that'll have a, a love hate relationship with it, but I've always liked that sort of. The magic should be, if mural, it should be, you know, mercurial. It should, you know, it's this esoteric, nebulous thing. And so when people you like this regimented, the spell works every time and it works the same way every, every time. time. Uh, and I know there's something to be, to, to like that as a player. Sure. But I like something about magic. It's, magic's supposed to be chaotic. It's supposed to be wild. And, and so it's not the same thing every time. And I like that if, if you go back to where I cut my teeth as a kid, the pulps, you know, Conan, uh, Elric of Melnabon, um, uh, Fat from the Grey Mouse or whatever. It was kind of like, okay, you can go train, strap on some armor, grab a sword, and go jack somebody up. But if you're that little weedy guy over here who's like, I want power, I want to be able to influence men and make people tremble in fear, but I'm some witty little guy, well, I'm going to learn magic. Well, if, if, if it's safe, why wouldn't everybody go learn magic? No, you're taking a chance. You're on the dice. You're playing with forces men were not meant to tamper with. And so it's dangerous. And that's how, like, a lot of times Conan would be all like, oh, God, this wizard is would put kind of a fear in him. But invariably, Conan would kick the salt circle and the, the demon would snatch the guy up and drag him to hell screaming or whatever. And Conan would, you know, crumbs bones and, and then grab the hot chick and, you know, it was what he sacrificed and run out of there. 
you know, so a lot of, so I mean, yeah, magic should be dangerous. Maybe that's what the, the condense this down. It shouldn't be safe. But know. that's the difference between a role playing game and pulp fiction. I guess sort so. of things because nobody's throwing fireball in Conan. Yeah. That was more of one of those, uh, the, the evil wizard has taken control of the king's mind so he can order the men to do whatever he wants. Yeah. That's where his power was at. Not, uh, he's just going to hit you with this ray of frost and you'll be dead. Which through the years I've played some games where magic was more subtle like that. And there's something to be said for a subtle magic. Well, there you go. Maybe that's what you really want. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I've, I've not thought about that much. I know I liked in one of the games where you could, and, and DCC has that, where like if let's say you're playing a, a cleric, priest, whatever, and you, there's no spell to accomplish what you want in the moment, you could you could call for like divine intervention. I think, you know, there's something like that in DCC. There's another game that had that, and the way they worded it for the game master was, it should be like a real miracle where the player should question, well, was that the hand of God or was it just happenstance? You know, I mean, leave that plausibility, that, you know, what deniable plausibility or where it's like, eh, was it a miracle? Was it not like say, okay, the players are all be getting their butts kicked by the ogre. And it, that, that last guy's facing off against the ogre and boom, he goes down later on. They wake up and they still have their belongings and they're not dead. And like, because right before the guy went down, he called out, oh, great, you know, crom or whatever, protect us. And then, boom, the ogre hit him in the head and he went down. Well, they're like, well, what happened? Well, unbeknownst to them, around the time that the ogre knocked him out and he was just starting to rifle through their pockets, um, a pack of ghouls showed up and scared him off, but they chased after him for some reason because they didn't see that. You could, you know, and then if the players look and they'd look, oh, look, there's tracks or something. Oh, something scared the ogre away. Oh, well, was that Crom or was that just happenstance? Hmm? I don't know. I mean, or was it that you didn't want to make new characters? Yeah. You're like, ah, come on. No, I've, they give you a mulligan on this one. I have TPK to, I mean, I don't like it. I don't want to do it, but I have TPK to party. Well, that just makes me think of games like Mythos where you're like, I can't die because nowhere are we spending two days in character creation again. No, that's just ridiculous, you know. Um, yeah, what was it? A buddy of ours was like, hey, we'll try, what's it, Mithras? Mythos. Mythos. And, oh, yeah, I mean, we were there three and a half hours, and we're like, so we're pretty much in. He goes, oh, no, no, but we'll we'll come back later and finish these. And we're like, no, <laughs> no, we won't. It's like, that's ridiculous. You'll finish these on your own. But that's like, I got to play Role Master with some guys. And obviously, Role Master is, is a good game, because there are a lot of people that played it and liked it, and these guys loved it. They played a campaign of it for years and years and years. But the guy, Daryl, uh, out of Shreveport is a great game master. And so, I mean, I think really wasn't so much about the game system, but I think it was more him. But, uh, at one time I was going to join them and yeah, I mean, character creation seemed to me like it took some work. And then my very first game, he's like, Oh, there's a rock falls from the ceiling. There's a special chart for that. And I'm like, what? And he rolls and he's like, okay, the rock hits you on the head and it's under your skull. And, and then, you know, you fell off the cliff and well, you're dead, you know? And I'm like, wait, what? And he goes, but wait, you can spend a fate point or whatever, and we'll negate that whole thing. And I'm like, well, what's the point of, of that? I'm like, what? You know, anyway, so uh, maybe that was just a bad first experience. But anyway. But yeah, talking about different games, like, you ever play Earth Dawn? I have not. Yeah, that was different. It had an interesting concept. But yeah. What was the interesting concept? Um, that basically, cause you figure it's kind of silly and other games are like, there's dungeons underground. Okay. Who's building these, ex these expansive subterranean, you know, layers or whatever, uh, you know, mad wizards, you know, or, or, you know, okay. But in earth dawn, the idea was like someone pierced the veil between their world and this world of, of basically these demons. And there, so there were other fantastic creatures in the world, but these things, these were these Cthulhu-esque tentacled mod horrors or what I think they actually called them the horrors or whatever. And they came to the world. And so to save themselves from these things, everybody moved underground. So that's aha. So that's why there were all these subterranean, like living, like sprawling complexes. 
people had to do that to avoid the horrors. Okay, so now you have the reason. But eventually the horrors were pushed back and, and fought back. And so now everybody's living above ground. And some of these things are forgotten. So then people stumble across them and go, oh, okay. And, and, but in the meantime, some of these horrors, ha-ha, what a switch. The people moved above ground. Some of the horrors have moved into these forgotten subterranean layers. Uh-huh. And one of the concepts I liked was from, for, for magic items. Um, they had a thing where like the item could grow with you. Because I always thought it was disappointing that in old D&D, you'd find that, that plus one sword at first level and you'd be so excited. Uh, and then by the time you're third level, you find a plus two sword and you just throw that one away. Just, just put it in the trash. It's like, wow, that was a sword. You beloved it. You, you, you named it. I mean, you know, yeah, but now I got a plus two sword. You're like, well, that's kind of disappointing. Well, um, in Earth Dawn, you'd find that initial magic sword and you'd be like, oh man, it's pretty cool. I've been tearing some monsters up with it. But then if you're smart, like in your downtime, you are like the party's wizard or whatever. You're like, hey man, would you do some research on this? And they like could look at the weapon and shift their vision into like the ethereal astral plane or whatever. And gazing upon the weapon, they go, oh, there's, there are threads connected to this. This thing is, is more powerful than it seems. You're like, oh, okay. But to unlock its other powers, you had to learn about its background, learn the lore about it, where it came from, who had wielded it before, what monsters did they destroy with it. And as you learn more about it and kind of like respect the weapon, like uh, it would unlock power. So I, wink, wink, as you grew and leveled as a character, the weapon grew with you. So you'd always have that beloved sword all the way up. And, and then plus you're more interested in the weapon because oh this thing has a history you know that was always I thought kind of a neat concept and anyway it, um, but yeah I mean there's like you know things like that that are just I would think th those, are, those are good concepts um, there's a friend of ours that asked us about um, 13th Age oh right and you haven't played it um, but I have I, I had a con or no it was a free RPG day and I like there were certain gimmicks it had that I like, but in the end, they're not so integral that the system that you couldn't port those over. So like I told him, well, if you like the gimmicks, just integrate them into whatever your current favorite role-playing game is. You know, like they have a thing where it's like an escalation dice or something. And the idea is uh, every turn, like, like the players start under the gun. Like it's built in, which I don't know if I like this, but you kind of start out the first round. You're kind of you're 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 kind of at a detriment. You're under the gun, but then as the rounds go by, you start getting this plus, and it builds. So the idea is, as the combat goes on, the playing field levels, and then eventually you're getting an advantage deeper into the combat, and then you can start doing all this freewheeling, wild kind of stuff because you've got these pluses. Anyway, that's one of the I, I might be misquoting the system, but. Hmm, that sounds interesting. Yeah. but So you got to run a game at uh, Geek World for Free RPG Day. You, you ran some Mutant Crawl Classics. Yep, always a winner. Yeah, and you ran your game you wrote, uh, Carnage in the Casino? Certainly. Oh. So what, what, did you have a good turnout? Yeah, it was uh, pretty good. No complaints. Good deal. Did you uh, pass out any? Uh, always. Good deal. All right. This is vague. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? I was I was gesturing basically. Uh, Eddie poker had, chips. Eddie had some specialty poker chips made that say Carnage in the Casino on them, and they're they're really cool looking. But uh, definitely wish I could have been there. <laughs> Were there any of the freebies that you did you get your hands on some of those? Yeah, I think I got the uh, well I. I assume the only thing that Goodman Games had was the DCC new play rules. The I don't know. It used to be the five dollar starter starter set. Mm -hmm. So I've got a copy of that for you. Why? Thank you. And was there anything else? I think that was it. I mean, as far as Goodman Games went. Yeah, but I know, like when I went in the past, they're like, "You can grab any too." And like one year, I got Kids on Bikes, the little starter for that. And they had another Kids on Bikes module, I think. Well, that's cool. I haven't played that, but it, it seems intriguing. Yeah. Definitely um, something to look at. So. Well, you got anything left in the grab bag for us? 
Well, you know, uh, I retired my uh, tournament adventure, which was Bloodbath at Allsville. A proven winner. Um, but, you know, I ran it three, four times at cons. I love on Thursday or Friday night, whatever the first night of the con is, running a tournament game. That's kind of my, my shtick, maybe. Um, I'm working on something new. And uh, Was there anything you'd like to let our listeners know about this something new? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about the theme is it's going to be you know, East Texas uh, up in um, Pittsburgh, Texas. is like there's the hot links. Yeah, but there's also the chicken plant. Like oh, the yeah, big Pilgrims. Pilgrims. Well, I wasn't going to mention your names, but okay. Pilgrims, Pilgrims Pride, Boat yeah. Pilgrim. Yeah, which there used to be the big head out there, the bust. Yep. It, I didn't see it last time I went by. No, I think it's been down. I thought it had been down for a while. But, but I wonder, like, was there a storm or who what knows? happened to the termites? I'm curious. But anyway, so I'm thinking about having uh, like a, a chicken. Uh, the adventure takes place in a chicken factory. That yeah. sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see. But I'm, I'm, I've got some ideas rolling around. I'm getting kind of excited. It's going to be fun. Who knows? I might dress up for this. Oh, my. Yeah. Like a thong. No, I'm kidding. A chicken costume? Yeah, maybe. I might give somebody a, a bad coupon. It takes a strong man to make tender chicken. You know it. But anyway, anything on your mind? Anything you wish to share? No, the only thing I'll say is that we're hitting that 36-minute mark. When all of our listeners completely lose interest, <laughs> well, keep them short. Wrap it up. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up for you, folks. Happy to say this is the first one I think we've done kind of back to back as a one week in between turnaround time. So we hope you appreciate that. Absolutely. And with that, this is Eddie. I'm out. This is Matt. Thank you for listening. <laughs>